Okay. So good morning. I welcome everyone joining the SP Ghana Young Professionals Workshop. My name is Matilda Tima. I'm currently working with the Halibut Operations Ghana Limited. And I will be moderating with a colleague in the person of Kelvin Ariapo. And he is who is a petrochemical engineering graduate. At a point in time, I'll back out and my co-moderator will take charge of the moderation. Please, am I audible? Yes, please. All right, thank you. Okay, so on behalf of SP Ghana Young Professionals, I once again welcome everyone and thank you for gracing this webinar with your presence. So on today's webinar, we have five profile professionals in the energy industry who are ready to share with us ways to unlock and open doors in the petroleum value chain. I encourage everyone to stay put down some notes and then apply them in due time. So I'll quickly move to the outline for this webinar. So first of all, you are going to receive a short address from the Young Professionals Chair. Once you still read that my co-moderator will come in, introduce the speakers, and the speakers will be given the floor to share their insight with us. Once the speakers are through, the floor will be open for questions. So right after that, you are going to receive the membership committee chair. He will come in and share something small with us. Then finally, we are going to have our closing remarks and appreciation. So, Fee, you have the floor. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. So, um, thank you very much, um, Mata. <clears throat> And let me also use this opportunity to thank our speakers who have taken time from their busy schedule to share with us their knowledge and their experience on this topic, which is unlocking the opportunities in the petroleum value chain, the local content development and youth, um, which is a local content and youth empowerment program that the SPE Ghana section young professionals team has been able to put together all to basically educate our young professionals or our industry players in relation to the faces um, in relation to the global unemployment uh, challenges as well as some challenges in relation to the local content um, issues in Ghana and outside Ghana these our speakers have actually worked not only in Ghana, but all around the world. And therefore I believe strongly that their experience or their knowledge that they are going to share will cover every aspect of the oil and gas industry or of the value chain that we are talking about. So this webinar will actually provide us about certain opportunities that we can tap into either as graduates or as students or experienced people in the industry. So I want to end here and say that let's all open, pay attention to whatever our speakers are going to tell us. And as Matilda stated, at the end, there'll be time for us to ask questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Fee. So my co my co moderator would take charge. So Kelvin, you have the floor now. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning again, and welcome to this workshop. Um, we are thrilled to have all of you here as we now dive into the presentations of our esteemed speakers. With over um, 50 years of combined experience in the industry, as Fifi said, our speakers are true experts, and they will provide us with invaluable insights on our topic today. So. Before we proceed, let's establish a few ground rules to ensure that we have a smooth and a productive session. So first of all, I would kindly like to request that all our participants um, keep their microphones muted throughout the presentations. And if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat box and we'll address them during the Q&A session. Okay, so now without much ado, let's get started. So our first speaker, be Dr. Papa Beni 
He's a mechanical and project engineer with 18 plus years of project development and implementation of crude oil refineries with over 10 years of FPSO operations and engineering management practice. Dr. Benin possesses a BSc mechanical engineering degree from KNUST Ghana, BSc and MSc engineering management degrees from Sweden, and a PhD from the USA in applied management and decision sciences with a focus on engineering management inclusive of leadership and organizational change. Dr. Benin is currently the managing director of Stack Energy, Energy Limited. He was previously the local manager for Modern Ghana operations, responsible for local content strategy execution and government liaison. Prior to that, he was the warranty, warranty officer for the Jubilee FPSO, and he further managed the Ready for First Oil project for the 10 FPSO. Dr. Benin has prior experience with ABB in Sweden and also with the Tema Oil Refinery in Ghana. He's currently a part-time lecturer at the Regional Maritime University, lecturing project management, research design, and technical report writing. And he also lectures part-time at the University of Cape Coast Institute for Oil and Gas Studies. He has authored um, publications in Offshore Africa Magazine and the Global Insight, focusing on aspects of local content participation, especially in Ghana's upstream sector. So Dr. Benin, please, the floor is yours. All right, thanks for that. Thanks for that. Um, um, is, that is that Fifi? So, are you going to project for me or I should project myself? I'm sure you're allowed to share your screen. Um, the host will allow you to share your screen. All right, let me try doing that now. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes, no. please, we can. Yes, right. please. Yeah. yeah, so basically, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I'm I'm currently out of the country for a meeting. So um, the internet here is not quite stable. So I hope that you, you guys bear with me. So if there's any question, you can feel free to put it at the chat box and I'll definitely address it. All right, so I'm going to touch on unlocking opportunities in the petroleum value chain. As you are aware, Ghana's oil and gas industry is relatively young. No, no matter how you see it, I mean, I'm 10 years or 12 years old, it's still, it's still quite young compared to other countries who have been doing about 60 years and then 80 years. And the rest. So what, what we do is, I mean, still the industry is quite young. I mean, we bring in expert trades, right? Ranging from managers to mid technical level personnel, right? Who are specialists in process engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical and transportation engineering, as well as marine operations to come and then transfer knowledge to indigenous of a country. We should bear in mind that when it comes to the support service, right, being it, I mean, HR, procurement, compliance, and the rest, we have lots of Ghanaians who are, I mean, well qualified to undertake those roles. So the main gap that we are having in Ghana's relatively young oil and gas industry is the technical support area for the technical specialist areas. So there's a huge gap when and producing commercial oil in about in 2010, the local content was extremely low, right? So some affairs came in for Jubilee and 10 FPSO to establish, I mean, best practices in transferring knowledge from expatriates to Ghanaians, right? So what we did, right, was to recruit fresh graduates as technicians and then engineers, and then of course we had to pass them through a structured training program. We sent them to JGTC, that the Jubilee Technical Training Center, went ahead to send them to the oil refinery to gain hands-on experience. Then we went ahead again to send them to the UK for their MVQ level three training, after which we brought them back to the FBSO to come and then understand the expatriates to enable them occupy the role. With my experience, I mean, with my 10 years, 
experience on, on time and jubilee FPS. So what I realized that I mean the younger ones are able to localize I mean expert notes rule much quicker than the those that claim to have I mean industry experience in other areas. So for me, there's a lot of opportunities I mean for the younger ones than those senior guys who claim to I mean, at least I mean know it all in our code. So what we did was to, at least, I mean, at first we were having a challenge with, I mean, expatriate contracts being open, but we weren't, I mean, kind of well, stating, we weren't kind of stating the contract duration in expatriate that, I mean, of course, they are supposed to be in Ghana for a limited period of time and then transfer knowledge to the Ghanaians to, to enable them occupy their role. So one of the essence learned was whenever each expatriate is coming to Ghana, we specify the contract duration. If it's three years, then we assign a, a Ghanaian to that expatriate and then make sure that, I mean, the expatriate transfers knowledge to the Ghanaian within the stipulated bureau. And then as I said, from experience, right, the younger ones is the localized expatriate rules than the senior guy, because the senior guy kind of come, up, come across um, as if they know it all, and then they fight the expatriate. And the ones um, you guys are young to, it's easier to mold and then shape you guys to where the company wants you to be. So as a best practice, we assign each expatriate to a local and at least come up with training programs that the Ghanaian should undertake or the indigenous should undertake to enable him or her localize the expatriate rules. Then we came up with a detailed localization and then association plan which is a live document. We came up with the template where on a monthly basis, we interview both the expatriates and then the Ghanaian right, to find out all the challenges that they are facing so that in case there's any issue or any gaps, we try to bridge it. Then of course, as a best practice, we try to automate the entire localization process to make it very, very transparent. What we realized that, I mean, the expatriates were kind of talking behind the indigenous back, while the Ghanaians were also kind of talking about the expatriate back. So we tried to create a forum where they could express themselves freely without any issue. So that in case there's any challenge or so, we have open discussions and then try and then resolve the issue. So with the challenges that I encountered, I mean, as you may be aware, um, also the QQC consultant to National Petroleum Authority in charge of the Central Oil Refining Project, which was recently commissioned by the President of Ghana about three weeks ago. So the challenges that I saw on Jubilee and Tanef was the same challenge that I'm kind of seeing um, at Central Oil Refining, where, of course, I can advise them to go for younger guys because it's easier to work with them. They could easily move them up to be what they want them to be. So it, there's a similar challenge with what I mean, we are witnessing at um, Central Africa right now. And the first challenge that I want to talk about is that there's a kind of pushback from the expatriates that I mean, locals are not ready to I mean, occupy expatriate roles since they are not experienced. As you may be aware, the expatriate focus more on technical training, maybe after high school, after their diploma, and then after, even of course, I mean, after their junior high school, they go to learn on the job when they are 18 years old, seven, I mean, 18 years old, 17 year old, and even 16 year old. Whilst we focus on the academics, so we are around 26 or 20, I mean, seven years old, where we go to the industry to begin our career. So these expatriate feel that oh, they have, they have I mean, done it for about 20 years, and then you and indigen, you are, I mean, you have about one year experience and then you are saying that within a year or two, you'll be able to localize my role. So they wouldn't agree and then they will put, they will try to put impediments in their way. But what I say is that in the midst of every challenge, there's an opportunity. So you have to see it as such. Once the expatriate is behaving, I mean, that way or so, you have to really calm down listen to where the expatriate is coming from, and at least do as what the expatriate says and 
a no matter. And then, of course, within a short period of time, you see that the expatriate will just say that, no, I think that I mean, he's not ready to be able to localize my role. I have seen it happen over and over again where the expatriate was kind of misbehaving in court. The Ghanaian I mean, state come, and then within a year or so, the expatriate would further recommend that so he's okay to localize my role. But if we write, if we try to challenge them, go and fight them, go and antagonize them and the rest, then definitely they will also hit back and then begin to say other things. So that's one of the strategies I mean, that I saw and I advised some of the younger Ghanaians to be able to deploy to overcome their challenges. So as I said earlier on, for every challenge, don't see it as an impediment, rather see it as an opportunity to overcome that to make you stronger. The other complaints at all, the other challenge that I also realized was there were lots of um, complaints from the Ghanaians or from the indigents that they are ready to occupy expatriate rule, but they are being denied. But I say to myself that what is experience? Experience is doing the same thing over and over again in different scenarios, right? If you're able to succeed in doing a same thing over and over again in a different scenario, and then you're able to at least overcome that challenge or so, then it means that you were experienced enough. These expatriates have been on about six or seven platforms before coming to Ghana. So we can't just be on a platform, do one or two scenarios for about, I mean, a year, six months or so, and then say that we are okay. And then we are okay to do what the expatriate has been doing for about 20 years or 17 years or 25 years or so. So I see a bit of a challenge there because most of us are not patients. We just want to quickly rise through the ranks and then maybe go and then occupy expatriate role. Right. Then of course, there were instances where we had direct complaints from both locals and expatriates directly to the American that Most of the Ghanaians went ahead to complain to the PC and then other bodies that, I mean, I mean, they are okay, they are better than the expatriates, they are ready to get by expatriate rules and then they are being denied. And of course, there are instances that the expatriates have also complained that we are trying to push Ghanaians to occupy expatriate rules and then we are um, not, um, we are making the vessel unsafe. And there are so many comments from both sides. But for me, if there are comments from expatriates, if the expatriates are not happy and then the Ghanaians are not happy, then at least, it tells us that something is working and then we're trying to keep a fair balance. And as I said earlier on, in the midst of every challenge, we rather have to see it as an opportunity and not as a barrier. Then of course, there were solid complaints among Ghanaians. Most of the Ghanaians complained that uh, they are, but they, um, the amount of money that they have been given on a monthly basis is just too small. I mean, they can't afford them. They do compare it to their especially and counterparts and see a huge gap and of course begin to complain. Most, most of them got demotivated along the line. But I say, it's about money or choosing your career. You have to choose one. Money and career do not go hand in hand. But if you choose your career wisely and you decide to learn on the work very well, in about 10 years, 15 years time, of course it's going to pay off with I mean, cash. So you have to choose wisely and as a young, as a young pro professional, don't go ahead to focus much on the money, rather focus much on learning the job and then building your career. Then strangely enough, there are instances where we promoted Ghanaians to occupy HOD rules, um, so between that rules and the rest. And then what I noticed was most of the Ghanaians below the ranks were antagonizing their Ghanaian supervisors and superintendents. Right. They were kind of, I mean, like they, they prefer expatriates being there than the Ghanaians. So, and then to me, it was just so strange. I was like, wow, you guys were fighting for expatriates to leave. To leave. We try hard to groom a Ghanaian to occupy that room. And then now you were saying that, no, the expatriates, I mean, the Ghanaian is, uh, well, the expatriate was occupying the room, I mean, or was much better than a Ghanaian. So what I realized that most Ghanaians are not supportive of their Ghanaian managers, right? So it's a big challenge that I saw on Jubilee and 10 FBSs. But as I said, it's a lesson that we all, that's of what we all learned from it. 
you guys are young, if you get there and then a Ghanaian is promoted to be your manager or your supervisor or a superintendent, you have to give that Ghanaian the support that you need. If you're not happy with something, you can have a one-on-one -on -one chat with that Ghanaian and then you can make sure that you trash things out. Then, as I said, I mean, earlier on, most of the Ghanaians had unionization mindset. You realize that in, in 2014, I mean, I mean, Jubilee has lost about 30 guys, right? They were kind of complaining and then they formed a union and then they were misled in one way or the other. And then they went on strike on the vessel to make sure that at least maybe all your production has not go on. And I feel that maybe having the minions Junior mindset as a young, I mean, lad wouldn't help, right? I mean, so it's something that I would, I would, I would, I would strongly advise against. If you have a challenge, you have a line manager. You have to go to your line manager to go and then, I mean, discuss with I mean him him right. about. <laughs> you have to move away from those union mindsets and the because it usually doesn't end up well. But and of course, I mean. As I said earlier on, there were Ghanaians trying to compare themselves with expatriates, especially when they're about to work in the West. They try to end the, 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 the same salaries as the expatriates, forgetting that, I mean, the expatriates do not have full allowance, they don't have um, PF, they don't have SNET allowance, and then all those things. So if you lump everything up, you realize that the differences between the expat salaries and the, the Ghanaian salary isn't that much. Of course, the expatriates leave their home country and they come to Ghana and they need a, a relocation allowance. Then, um, believe it or not, I mean, I've worked with so many nationals, but we Ghanaians have a sense of entitlement. And it's a major challenge that I saw on Jubilee 10 FPS. And that's what I'm even seeing um, at the sense you're referring now. We have a sense of blindness. We have, a sense of belonging and then a sense of entitlement that it's our right to end this salary, it's our right to be to occupy this role, it's our right. And it's something that I usually touch on when I lecture my students that we should move away from that sense of entitlement, be professional, go according to what the organization I mean has for us. If you have any issues, we speak to the HR, we speak to our land managers and then try and then trash it out, right? And um, I've hammered on this before. We have locals, right, or Ghanaians antagonizing their supervisors, right? I mean, when they are eating or they are in their comfort zone, they begin to say bad things about their um, supervisors and managers and all those things. And I think it doesn't really work that well. When somebody slips and then goes to tell the manager that's not just what you're junior staff or your junior colleague is saying about you, it creates so much tension. So we should move away from antagonizing our supervisors. And attitudinal problem, right? I noticed that the different, the major difference between the expatriates and then the indigenous, that's the Ghanaians, is that expatriates are more professional than the Ghanaians, right? And expatriates will have an argument with you over the work, the next moment he's working with you. But we Ghanaians, we have an argument or a, a misunderstanding with our, our colleagues, and they will make sure that it translates onto the work that we are doing. So it's a major challenge that I saw in June 2019, and that's what I'm also witnessing as sent you or your family. So I've summarized all the prevailing challenges that we had, or and then we are still having. And then I believe that once you have that at the back of your mind, you should be able to develop strategies to overcome them. And once you're able to overcome them, the sky is your limits. You'll be loved by the company and then and then desperate. And then in no time, you realize that you are quickly rising through the ranks. For the opportunities, um, I've hammered on the challenges and then I'm, I am going to touch on the opportunities, right? What I have to say is that, I mean, Ghanaians, Right, I had working, or most Africans are hard working. And of course, I mean, um, the foreign companies that come over to Ghana, you should understand that it is cheaper for them to employ Ghanaians than expatriates. In the sense that once they employ Ghanaians, once they employ indigenous of the country in which they, they don't work, it's a positive image for them as well. And then of course, if you 
and we take away the spot and allow one sense the flight tickets and all those things that the expatriates bring over to all, I mean, the expatriates add to the country or the expatriates or the expatriates cost that adds to the operations cost. I mean, you realize that, no, it's a bit cheaper to use indigenous of a country to run the operations than bringing in expatriates. I did an analysis for Jubilee and 10 FPS, and then I just realized, and then I came up with the analysis that if you go ahead and then employ about, I mean, 25 Ghanaians fresh graduates, and then you offer them training within the next three years or so, you were able to save about $5 million of the expatriates, right? By just um, employing, I mean, Ghanaians and they may be training them. So this expatriate family know that, that it is cheaper for them to at least employ Ghanaians, group them, and then let them occupy okay, expatriates. So once they do that, their operational cost comes down, the government is happy with them, everybody is happy with them, and then they're able to even win more projects in other African countries and then other third world countries. So have that at the, at the back of your mind, that it is the interest of the expatriates to employ locals and not to employ I mean, expatriates because it's cheaper for them and then it comes with a good positive image. Right? So having this at the back of your mind, Right, you should avail yourself. Right, make sure that I mean you contact people via LinkedIn. I mean, chat them up. Make sure that you avail yourself to industry professionals. Right, have them train you, have them mentor you, have them guide you, and then have them show you all the I mean gaps and then the loopholes and everything that you need to close in order to at least get employment in this. I mean offshore sector as well as the downstream sector. What I usually do is that, I mean, based on the experience with, I mean, on Triple and 10 FPS, so I, I usually go in for fresh graduates, not, I mean, above, I mean, I'm 26 or so. Then I spend time to really, really, really do them. I spend time, talk to them on a daily basis. As you can see in, in, the, in the picture, they mentor them, train them, put them through a strategic training program, and at least, I mean, instill some sense of confidence in them, of course, polish up the attitude and everything, and then make sure that they are ready to be part of the pool that can be, or that can work in Ghana, or that can be sent in Angola or other West African countries to go and then work. And we have done it before. And then I'm saying this on, on authority, that once you avail yourself to be properly groomed, once you apply for internship and then all those things, I mean, definitely the opportunities, the opportunities are going to be immense. So the key takeaway, I mean, point here is spend time with the senior guys around. Approach them, send them email, and at least find about one hour or talk to them to get about one hour of their time to sit with them, to let them talk to you about the experiences. And I can guarantee that the benefits are going to be immense, right? So on the way forward, right, we should understand that the oil and gas sector is certification driven. No one cares about your master's, no one cares about your PhD, no one cares about your bachelor's. Your bachelor's degree is just to say that now you are able to learn, understand that they implement what you have learned in school. So don't think that your master's degree or your, or your PhD is going to get you a job. Right there, focus on the certification courses, right? There are so many of them around. You can go online, search for them, apply for them. Let your dad or your uncle or so sponsor you for some of the certification courses and the tickets, and then just leave your master's degree and then your PhD behind, because that's what's going to get you the job. As I said, the difference between the expatriates and then the locals is that the expatriates are not as highly educated as the Ghanaians, but then they know the work, they are hands on, and we should move away, I mean, as indigenous of a country to be more hands on. I'm going ahead to focus on academic qualification. The academic qualifications are okay, but that's not what is going to really get you a job in the oil and gas industry. At least if you have the basic fundamentals or, or foundation of a, of, a, of a bachelor's, focus on getting practical experience, the certification, and if you decide to continue with your master's and then your PhD, you can just work ahead and then do that. The second point is you are supposed to apply for voluntary internship. I know that most of us want money. I mean, 
at least to take care of business, to take care of so many other things, but you should be able to sacrifice and then approach companies, apply for voluntary internship. I've had somebody from Kumasi just pick up the phone and then call me. Well, he saw my number on the internet and then his exact statement was, oh, I have finished school. I had the first class in mechanical engineering. I am home. I just want to apply for voluntary internship. That statement alone would touch me. The next day I was like, oh, can you come over to Accra? I'll have a place for you to stay and then come and then start the internship. So what you should have at the back of your mind that no, even though you make a case that you want to apply for voluntary and internship or so, no company is going to watch you, I mean, pick a car by your own and then maybe get to work and then go back without giving you any incentive. So that's one of the strategies that you should use. Go ahead and apply for voluntary internship. If your company decides not to give you any money for transportation and the rest, do not complain. You can rely on your uncles or your, your parents and the rest to at least support you with the transport. But once you do that, once you have the intention, it means that you are building a profile for yourself, you are building a career for yourself. And definitely when the experience is there for a year or a few months or so, definitely doors are going to open. Right. Then I also want to touch on attitude, right? I mean, these days you don't really get Ghanaians with, with attitude, right? I mean, maybe their behavior, there are instances that one guy I sent you or your friend came to me that I mean he's been fired. I was like, how can you you have been fired? Then he was like he was doing something, and then a Chinese came to I mean yell at, at him and they maybe just push him off an equipment. Then he also turned, got annoyed, and they maybe pushed the Chinese and they began to fight the Chinese. I was like, so how do you do that in the first place? If your boss is angry and then your boss has touched you, even though that might not be right that doesn't give you the authority to go and then push him and then go and then fight your boss so it's a major challenge that i am seeing we should have at the back of our mind that companies hide for high for attitude they don't have for competency so we should rather focus on building ourselves to have a positive attitude a positive learning attitude once we have the positive learning attitude it means that you, have, you can be groomed to do whatever they want you to i mean do but, and as I said on the first slide, you have to choose very wisely. Money and career do not go hand in hand. You have to choose one. If you want to choose money, then you're better off doing 419, Sakawa, and then all those things. That's where you're, that's where you're able to get more cash. But if you want to focus on your career, do not bring money in. Just focus on your career for the next five years, 10 years. Make sure that you have learned on the job very well. And definitely, the benefit you should be able to take a long <laughs> at building your career. You should take a long, you should sit down and then plan for the next <laughs> Tell yourself, I just want to be here, right? And then apply for the internship, apply for job, focus on the money. Make sure that you have enough experience for the job that you are doing. And then gradually, rise to the rank, the properly mode so that you want to be. Then the last point that I want to touch on is that there's still a gap in the technical area for the human resource, the, the procurement, and then other support areas. That area is true. We have enough Ghanaians that are capable of doing that job. But that doesn't mean that if you are an HR person, if you didn't keep on trying, you, should, you could apply for internship and the rest, right? But the main gap is with the engineering field. So your target area should be process engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical instrumentation, marine operations, onshore support, as well as project engineering. And then there are companies that offer these services below, right? That offer, I mean, there are vendors or competitors that go ahead to offer small boards tubing repair services, easier inspection for electrical, servicing of control valve, pressures, service safety valve, pressure control valve, calibration, flange management, the lodge system, of course, I mean, lagging and installation, and the rest of the and apply for internships and over there. Make sure that you do a good job with them and then the opportunities are going to be a mess. 
So for the last time, I have tell you one, I have seen it before. I have paid first draft from school, passed them through a started training program. Some of which are, are currently working on vessels in Angola and the vessels in Africa Coast as well. You can see, I mean, 12 stack in any energy engineers here working on the Saxi FPSO in Angola, as well as the SPO, the SPO FPSO in Africa Coast. But then these are fresh graduates that we spend time to groom them, focusing on attitude. And it has paid off. So what I want to say that it is easily doable. Once you know the challenges at stake and once you press on the right, but definitely you'll be able to succeed. And then do not see a challenge as a barrier, rather overcome them and then definitely the sky is going to be your limit. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Benny, for that insightful presentation. And we'll remember those words that um, challenges should be seen as opportunities. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll move to our next speaker. So our next speaker is Madame Nidra Yabua, who is a senior geologist with over a decade of experience in the oil and gas industry. She holds a BSc in geology and an MSc in petroleum geoscience from the University of Ghana. She's currently serving as the digital and integration account manager at SLB, where she oversees various technical business development aspects of the company's greater Accra operations. Prior to that, uh, Madame Nidra held the positions of senior geologist and SIS geologist at SLB. Also earlier in her career, Madame Nidra worked as a policy analyst at the Integrated Social Development Center, where she conducted extensive technical research on the various policies affecting the extractive industry in Ghana. Beyond her professional roles, Madame Nidra is also an active volunteer and a board member of several organizations, including the American Association of Petroleum Geologists and the Society of Petroleum Engineers. Madame Nidra, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you guys can hear me clearly. Yes, please, we can. Awesome. All right. So I have a few slides to show. I'm going to go through it really quickly so that um, we, we don't run out of time. So let me give me sharing right so that I can share my screen. Okay. Let's see. Screen two. Okay. Just let me know once you can see it. Yes, madam, we can see your screen. Awesome. Right. Okay. So once again, thank you very much. I think you might need to mute. I hear people talking. The foreign companies. I hear people talking in the background. Could you mute everybody yes. and just unmute me? All right. I mean, mute. Yeah, unmute me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you very much um, for that. So essentially, I looked at what we were supposed to discuss today, and I just put a, just a few slides to help drive the discussion, um, you know, building up from the previous presentation. So I, I titled it The Future Generation Taking Charge, right? So I'll start with a question. What does the future of energy hold for you? And I am sure that's a question that is big on everybody's lips, because every day we are faced with a whole lot of news around um, carbon, um, uh, climate change and uh, COP28 and every time everybody's talking about there's change coming and there's so much happening. And that question is on everybody's lips. For the young graduates who is just out of school is on the lips of those of us who are even already in industry and at different levels, at the, at, the, at the governmental levels, policy level, everybody keeps asking this question. Of course, it's work in progress, but we are, we are moving. Now, um, what I want us to understand is that the truth is that the future of oil and gas rests largely in our hands, whether we like it or not. Um, we are still going to have energy needs. In fact, we still have significant energy poverty, especially on this part of our planet, right? On this, I mean, uh, in this continent. So it's not something that we are going to say we are going to fix it overnight. And we are not going to say that oil and gas is going to disappear overnight. It's not, it's not I mean, we, people wish that, but it's not going to happen. We are still going to be in business for a long time. However, what we can do is that we can take up a collaborative approach in, in the way we move and how we extract our oil and gas, because I am for extraction of the oil and gas. Now, so there are some terminologies that are being thrown about. I'm sure we hear it all the time. Oh, there's a fourth industrial revolution. Um, we hear digitization. We hear um, AI. We hear machine learning. And then we talk about um, disruptive technologies. Um, now we, we, we are seeing a lot of um, 
even at the airports, let me take a typical airport. You go to the airport, sometimes you can literally check in through, do everything without even coming into contact with a human being. You can get into a country and out of a country without seeing anybody. Everything is smart, everything is enabled. And of course, this brings the fears that, hey, are we going to have jobs and all of that? So these are all things that we keep seeing on a daily basis. And of course, there's the popular Gen Z term, right? Where a lot of us coming up or a lot of the generation coming up are the younger um, folks, the late 90s to early um, 2010s, I look at them as innovative. I look at them as resourceful because I'm, it's amazing to see some of the things that um, you see these days. If you go on social media, you see a lot of creativity. So most times I know people use Gen Z in, a, in quotes, almost a negative manner, but I see them as uh, a generation of really smart people that are really going to take things uh, a notch higher. Now, let's bring it down to our industry. So we are no strangers to the current challenges and controversies that um, are surround that's surrounding the oil and gas industry. As I said, we talk about climate change, we talk about energy transition, we talk about technological disruption in the ongoing um, you know, industrial revolution. Now, these are challenges in itself, but I like to be an optimistic person because as we see the challenges, it also opens up a world of op opportunities for people, right? A world of possibilities. Now, we... What does this mean to you? I mean, there are opportunities for innovative solutions in the sustainability field, in the digitization field. I know, I know, I don't know how many people remember iRobot movie, right? I mean, it was it was more or less like an opening, or it gave us an insight into how these things were going to work. At that time, it was pretty much a fun movie, futuristic movie, but now we see it actually happening in real life, right? So a lot of companies have gone beyond okay, looking at this as just a concept and are beginning to incorporate. Um, artificial intelligence and machine learning workflows into their daily, you know, um, operations. So for the young and upcoming generation, what this is going to mean is that there are opportunities for you to move beyond your core technical skills, right? So reservoir engineers may will begin to find opportunities to, you know, ad use some advanced technologies and AI to maximize um, oil and gas um, recovery whilst they minimize the environmental impact. Even in process engineering, the way we design and implement processes is going to change because we will now be doing that with the intention of reducing emissions and wastes. Then we've heard about the very popular carbon capture and storage. I don't know how many people listen to um, Dr. Okorafo's um, um, lecture. It was really fantastic. She really broke it down. But you see how we are developing and implementing technologies to capture and store carbon. So these are all opportunities that are going to come up. And these, when you break them down into smaller, they, they, they offer opportunities in terms of job roles that you can do. So what are some focus areas? Generally speaking, um, decarbonization technologies. You know, we are, we are gonna be looking a lot at efficiency and emissions reduction. I don't believe that we are going to stop using oil and gas. I don't think we should leave our oil and gas in the ground. It's a resource that we, we need to use, we'll use it. However, we would, be, we would work towards implementing low carbon technologies to extract that, right? And then look into all this caption, uh, carbon capture and storage projects. And then where we can integrate with renewable energy, we integrate with it on the digitization um, um, angle, digitalization, we want to leverage cloud and data solutions to enhance integration. So whereas you are spending so much time maybe building a reservoir model, right, now you are spending less time because you have access to, you know, um, insights from maybe multiple data from different parts of the world. So that helps to speed up your decisions. And all of this comes together in collaboration. Now, collaboration is never going to be something that is going to be replaced by AI or machine learning. It's collaboration normally talks about human beings. I mean, you need to, we need to want to do something. We need to come together. Here do we've been having a situation whereby people have this um, almost, uh, what word will I use? This very combative way of working, right? Where um, is the government against the industry and then local company against the um, international, international and employees against management. That's not going to work in the in the era we are moving to. We need that cross-generational um, knowledge sharing if we are going to see any any change in the way we do things. So what's the way forward, right? This is what I'm thinking now from the operator. So there are different stakeholders, as I mentioned, we have the operators, we have the service organizations like SLB where I work, we have the regulators like the Petroleum Commission, and then we have academia because most times, sometimes we tend to leave them out of the conversation. For the operators, they have the big ball, they have the big, the big purses, right? So they, they, there's gonna be the need to continue investing in people and technology. Um, you're gonna to have to start upskilling people so reservoir engineers are there, but they have to start learning a bit of data science. They need to start going into these other 
areas that are going to help them maximize their core skills or core technical skills. On the service organizations part, which SLB is doing very well, we continue to innovate. We have so many innovation programs internally now where we even have competitions encouraging people to come up with new solutions. And we call it like an entrepreneurship Things. So companies are doing that. Some companies are doing that. Forward thinking companies are doing that. On the regulators, they will have to create the enabling environment, right? So currently in Africa, a lot of countries don't have clear regulations on their um, cloud um, ability to use the cloud. So it's a gray area. So you want to deploy a cloud solution that you know is going to really bring uh, be a game changer, but then they can't give you a definitive answer whether you can use it or not simply because there are no regulations. So it's time for the regulators to begin to look into that space, the ministries and then the Petroleum Commission, you know, all the bodies that need to be there to look into how can we maximize and use this because whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. So whether you, you, you choose to go digital or not, it's going to happen. And what happens is that when the world leaves you, then you have to run to catch up which we have if we have a habit of doing sometimes in Africa. But I think this time we need to change it. And for academia, we need to move from just our core writing papers and just because it's a technology, it's, it, 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 it counts for our professorship, but to actually investigate in real life problems. And I love what KNUST is doing with that. And um, they'll be hearing more of that in the coming days because they've set up um, you know, a board to help them you know, channel um, real industry problems into school research, where the, the, this, in this case, they are investigating real problems that would actually test on the field. So that way you can begin to see and bring value. All of this that I've said plays out to your advantage as the young engineer there. You need to continue to strengthen your core knowledge because guess what? You're still going to need your petroleum engineering skills, your reservoir engineering skills and all those skills. So that's not gonna go away. The continuous updates and research, the world is changing so fast. Almost every month, there's something new. So I love the fact that SP, there's always the JPT, there's always papers. Don't take it for granted. At the very least, read the abstracts because it gives you an idea of how things are changing so that by the time you come in there, you don't feel like things sound like uh, Latin to you, but then you are, you are keeping up with the trends. And then there's the upskilling, the soft skills. It's very important. Writing, um, learning how to write, presentation, presenting yourself, um, elevator pitch, et cetera. So these things you might think that always oh, cliche, but it's very important because sometimes you just have a minute or two to make an impression. And it's important that you have, you are well put together. So these skills are also very helpful. You are going to be working in diverse environments. Some of you will come into the multinationals. You need to learn how to um, communicate, collaborate, teamwork. These are things that you can get easily from volunteering. And that's why I always encourage people to a volunteer. SP is perfect for that. And last but not least, the networking. You continue to network, professional development, take advantage of um, SP NIAs and all those conferences where you can write paper, write papers, come together. Don't be too, I want to do it all by myself because I want to take all the credits. Come together, put yourself in teams and then come up with you know great concepts, um, you know, put an abstract, go out there, test it, get the data from the free data. I know Equino and Co have all this free data available. Use some of that and, and grow yourself because at the end of the day, these are the ways that you are showing value even before you've gotten into the industry. And with that, I would like to bring my presentation um, to a close. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Madam Nidra. That was a very excellent presentation with great insights and about uh, sustainability, digitalization, and then the importance of collaboration, especially as uh, young professionals and young ones trying to um, make our feet in the industry. And then also iterating the fact that oil and gas is not going away anytime soon. We thank you so much for that presentation. Thank you. So our next speaker, would be is Dr. As Mr. Kweku Boating, and he's an energy economist with over 20 years of senior management and leadership experience in the oil and gas industry, with a proven record of oil and gas project management, regulation, and energy policy formulation. He's currently the director for local content at the Petroleum Commission Ghana. He also worked as a senior manager for gas commercialization and business development at the Ghana National Gas Company. Earlier, he worked at BOST as the head of natural gas division, responsible for the company's gas business. And then prior to joining BOST, he was with the Ministry of Energy as the head petroleum upstream, and also as a director petroleum responsible for both upstream and downstream operations. 
He has several years of teaching and research experience in a number of academic institutions, such as the Southwest Business School in Finland, and also at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. He has excellent knowledge in commercial policy and regulatory aspects in the sector. So Mr. Boateng, the floor is yours. Hello, Mr. Boateng. Hello, good morning. Yes, good morning, sir. I'm trying to on the video. Uh, yes, we can see. Can see yeah. Yeah, um, good morning, everyone, and sorry for joining late. I'm far away in Georgetown, in Guyana. I was having challenges with the internet um, in my room. It's quite early in the morning here. So um, I have to come to the lobby to do the presentation. So there'll be some few challenges, but I hope that things will work well. So thank you very much, everyone. And I thank you. SPE for giving me this um, opportunity um, to share with our young ones the opportunities in the upstream oil and gas sector and how to unlock these opportunities. I just listened to uh, Ms. Eboa from Cambridge and I think that she has really said a lot of things that I needed to share with you. But nevertheless, I will add a few things to what she said. So give me a minute, let me try to share my presentation um, with you. Can you see the presentation? Yes, sir, we can. Okay. Yeah, this is the outline of the presentation. I was told I have about 10 or so minutes, so I'll try to um, be quite quick so that you have a discussion during the panel discussion if there are any questions. I will quickly take you through the um, overview of Ghana oil and gas industry to know the state of the industry and what exists in the future. Then you look at the human resource development in the sector um, from the point of view of the local content regulations and initiated by the government, and how our young um, engineers and professionals can uh, handle the opportunities in the sector. Yeah, I, th I think I don't think we need this one. I was actually goes to the uh, upstream value chain. Essentially, Mr. Boateng, I think you're He's muted. He's muted. He's muted. I think you're muted. Hello, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, now we can. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. So every um, stage within the value chain comes with different opportunities and set of activities. The, at, the upstream value chain begins with the licensing for blocks where the companies come in, um, identify area of interest, and if they are okay with the, um, the prospects, the area of interest, they enter into negotiation with the government to acquire the block or the acreage. Then once they acquire the acreage, they move to the exploration stage. Then um, if they are successful with the exploration, they get the move to appraisal, the development, production, and finally, at the end of the field life, they have to decommission the field. Then to Ghana, we have one field which is um, going to decommission. So uh, I just decided to bring the car um, activities with the chain for us to know that there are different sets of activities and different requirements in terms of skill sets at each stage of the upstream sector. Now, 
<clears throat> as was said by the uh, the previous um, presenter, there are still opportunities within the upstream oil and gas sector in view of the challenges in the the energy transition. The oil and gas sector still continue to be a, a significant component of global energy mix, especially for African continent and emerging economies. And even for advanced countries, we just recently seen from the recent war between Ukraine and Russia that the oil and gas sector will continue to be as for a foreseeable future. The um, companies, international companies, are now adopting new technologies that um, are enable them to extend the full life and also unlock reserves in previously uncharted world areas in Arctic and in more deeper water in many parts of the world. And the drive for industrialization among the emerging economies will continue to increase the demand for fossil fuels in the foreseeable future. Now, before we look at the how to the um, <clears throat> unlock the opportunities in Ghana's upstream oil and gas industry, let's look at the state, the current state of the industry in Ghana. As you all know, we, Ghana has four sedimentary basins, three are offshore basins and one onshore basin. We have the Eastern Basin, the Krakita Basin, which um, is not very well explored. But for, recent, for the recent years, there have been increasing interest in this basin. At least now have two super majors that have expressed interest in the basin and the process of licensing data um, to assess the prosperity of the basin. Then you have the, the Sopon Basin, the central basin is the basin that first um, registered Ghana's name uh, among the League of Oil Producing Countries back in the early 70s. First upon fuel produced for nearly a decade. That fuel, as you know, um, is now under the commission. Then you have the tunnel basin or the western basin, which is the most prolific of all the basins that you have in Ghana. Uh, major, most of the activities are carried on and where you have the three oil producing fields also located. And last, you have the, the onshore Botanian Basin covering about 40% of the land mass in Ghana, which is currently being explored by um, GMPC. Now let's look at the outlook of the industry. Um, I have to say that the, the three producing fuels, Jubilee 10 and Talo, and, and so Jubilee, Jubilee 10 and OCTP, have now reached a point of decline, as you can see from the first chart, that unless um, we do further exploration and make discovery on those fuels, we have reached the declining fees from these three fields. What we have in the, as the yellow in the bar chart is the anticipated production from the pecan fields being operated by AK Energy. Now they call themselves pecan energy. Um, we, it's anticipated by that by 2027, 2026, this field may will come on stream and continue to extend the <clears throat> production profile in our basin. Now let's look at the, the kind of infrastructure that we have in our basin. And this will tell us the opportunity that may exist for our young people. Now we have the three IPSOs. If we want to be added, by 2027, uh, earliest last quarter of 2026. We had a subsea systems kind of existing, the three fields. We have gas pipeline being operated by Ghana Gas and new stream by Gensa. 
you have one gas processing plant, if you plan to another add a second train, and Ghana gas is the process of um, <clears throat> um, getting investors to invest in the second train. You have the one onshore gas receiving facility be operated by SP oil and gas on behalf of ENI. You have some vessels, um, SCVs, PSVs, and other vessels currently in our uh, basin. You have shore base being operated by many um, companies, fabrication yards, cementing units, tank cleaning, thermal absorption plants, OCTG yards, and machine shops, aviation hangars, and some engineering firms also creating the country and are taking various feed and other engineering uh, <clears throat> activities. Now, looking at the future, what are you doing? You know, I mentioned earlier on about the declining reserves. Now, the question is, what are we doing to make sure that we sustain the industry? Now, 10 fields um, have suffered some decline, sharp decline in production. The operator, the 10 partners, are uh, putting <clears throat> measures in place to um, arrest the decline in 10 fields. They have prepared a draft um, POD or 10 enhancement program or TAPO, 10 amendment period. To, and the purpose of this um, proposed project is there are some discovered uh, but undeveloped resources, the 10 area um, in the um, Chimbua West, Danta, <clears throat> and Wawa, which they want to do for that. Um, exploration and drain to bring some of these discovered resources into production. There are also other prospects, which they are also seeking permission of government to do further exploration and to bring those prospects um, into production if they are successful with the exploration. And the top of, of the 10 enhancement project involves bringing additional infill walls. And they also intend to undertake multi-world drain campaign and also increase natural gas production to support the domestic energy supply and industrialization. And the Jubilee Fall, which was just completed um, in October or so, added additional 30,000 barrels per day to Jubilee Fall. And as part of the um, 10 asset project, they will undertake infrastructure-led exploration whereby they will tie the subsea system to the existing 10 um, APSO, which will require third-party access to the existing infrastructure. Um, hello, Mr. Watson. Yes. yes. Um, we just wanted to request if we could, we have a little bit of time left, so. Okay, all yes, right. thank you. And then, the, then I'll talk about the Pecan um, fraud which we hope that will come on stream um, in the next few years. And the Pecan, um, there are about seven discoveries that will start with the development of the Pecan fraud and later on, we we'll add the other discoveries. Then the Wotea Basin, which I said that GMPC currently is in the process of taking the recognition survey for the Wotea Basin. And currently, they are <clears throat> In the third phase of the Wotan Basin, where they are acquiring some 2D assessment uh, to determine the, um, the existing petroleum system. And once that is determined, the government will open the area for um, licensing. And there are other companies such as Amini, Eco Atlantic, and Oku, which we are hoping that they will undertake the drain activities by Q4 2024. Now, what does these projects 
offer for our for Ghanaians in terms of employment. Um, I have to say that under the local content regulations, the government and part of the government policy to um, devote the capacity of Ghanaians under the AOGC, a number of measures have been put in place to enhance the capacity of Ghanaians. Um, currently, um, we have trained about 150 young technicians and engineers in various areas in um, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, process instrumentation. We have also sent some faculty members from selected technical universities to Canada to build their capacity. And we are also in the process in the next few months, we will, next few weeks, sorry, we we'll send additional about 10 or so um, faculty members from selected technical universities to Singapore to enhance their capacity. Now let me let me for the sake of time let me just go um so, uh, let me just yeah now what uh, I want to just share with you that. Despite the military um, um, <clears throat> decline in activities in the industry in the recent years, um, there's still potential for our young people in terms of employment. Now, when we look at the data currently, um, in the core technical area in the oil and gas industry, where there's a need for technicians and engineers. The employment of Ghanaians is now about, it's about 80% for locals and 20% for um, experts. And in terms of the management, managerial rule, Ghanaians now occupy about 75% in managerial rule and for other services, Ghanaians occupy about ninety six percent. Now, um, what the commission intends to do under the Ghanaian initiative is to make sure that we increase Ghanaian participation in the core technical areas, the current seventy five percent to about around eighty five percent. Now. <clears throat> Let me now let me just go to this slide. How to how do we analyze the opportunity industry? My recommendation to our young <coughs> sorry, our young engineers is that one, you should focus on career and talent development, which is key, especially if you have to move Ghanaians from the low skill employment to core technical activities. The need for us to invest in core and talent development. And this is what AOGC program seeks to do. There's also a need to mentor and coach the young people that um, are yet to enter the industry. Uh, sorry, those that have entered the industry. We need exposure to new technologies and innovations. And the most important is the need for professional networking to so that the young people will know the opportunity that exists in the sector. Now, transferable skills to other areas. Very often, when people are trained as petroleum engineer, chemical engineer, I mean, we close our mind to other opportunities that exist in other allied industry. The skills that we acquire in our engineering profession, in our, in our, our independent um, disciplines, can also be applied to other areas. And you have to open, be open and see the opportunity that exists in other manufacturing, mining, and other areas. You also have to look for opportunities in the diverse 
roads along the oil and gas valley chain in the midstream and even downstream. And you also have to open our mind to consider that exists in, at, at the international or uh, different geographical areas. I'm trying to in Guyana, it's an emerging oil and gas producing area country and with a population of less than um, 1 million people. And from the many times I've seen over here, I've seen a lot of people coming from other countries try to seek opportunities here in the emerging oil and gas industry. So now Guyana is op opening up. Namibia is another area that is offer also offering prospects for our young um, technicians and engineers, which you have to really also um, look for those opportunities. So the labor mobility is one key area that you have to look at. And this just look at the various opportunities. Apart from the core oil and gas activities, there are indirect activities which also offer opportunity for our um, young technicians. Now you need to acquire new skills, embrace new technologies, and also build a personal brand around us, a niche in a particular area that we can show to prospective employers that we are different. Now, how to analyze this opportunity? I think this should be the last slide. Now, very often, young people and naturally so always seek to be employed by existing companies. What I also advise is that you have to look for opportunity to start your own company in a very small way. Now, the good thing is that the local content regulations have opened up and made amendments for an open up for formation of China partnership and strategic alliance. The good thing about China partnership is that there's opportunity to bring in many international companies as your channel partner. You don't have to necessarily go through the JV process. Yeah, now we have a lot of OEMs, original equipment manufacturers that supply various machinery and spare parts to operators and subcontractors here in our um, in Ghana. Um, the young people should look at opportunity of acting as a channel partner by partnering with this OEMs where they will provide after sales support services for them. And Patrol Commission is ready to support such initiative. And you have to be creative and innovative in finding solutions. I've seen a lot of young people that started their own business. Beginning it was very difficult, it was hard, but with perseverance, some of them have found their feet and providing some rich services to the operators and service companies in the oil and gas industry. So in conclusion, what I will say is that strong steel base is critical for the sustainability of oil and gas sector. And local content regulation provides opportunity for employment and training of Ghanaians and developing local expertise to maintain a degree of control in the sector. The Commission will continue to spearhead the development of local content and participation of young entrepreneurs. And I think OAGC program offer a lot of opportunities for young people to acquire and feel ready skills in the industry. And I encourage our young people to take this opportunity to build their skills and acquire some role or play an important role in the industry. So um, I bring the presentation Friends over here, and I uh, will be ready to join the panel discussion to answer the questions. Thank you very much for your audience. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Boateng, for that presentation, uh, showing us the future of the industry and in the, its current state and all the opportunities that it presents. So we're very thankful to all our speakers for your insights, and we, are, we have learned so much. Now it's time for the Q&A session where we have the opportunity to ask our speakers questions that we have. And so, um, first of all, I see a question in the 
chat box. And we would just like to say that we are far behind time. So maybe we can um, be quick about this and then be done. So the first question to Dr. Papa said, Dr. Papa mentioned that companies hire for positive learning competencies. As someone with a bachelor's degree in social science and currently pursuing master's in energy economics, can I still be trained to perform engineering functions? And again, can you throw more light on some of the opportunities that may exist for energy economists in Ghana, since most of the things um, they shared are engineering inclined? Yeah, um, thanks for that, Brad. Actually, the comments I passed was companies oh, high okay. <laughs> Not for competencies, I mean, basically. for energy economics, I think there's an opportunity for the commercial aspect of their business. These days, almost every, I mean, foreign company has a commercial department. So there are still um, opportunities. And that those areas are usually occupied by Ghanaians. So I'm sure that you can apply for internships who are in the state and then you are Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a so question for Madam Nidra. Please, can um, you please mute your mics if you're not talking? Okay, thank you. All right. Unmute, Kelvin. Okay, yeah. Um, so you spoke about the evolving landscape and then the technology advancement and all of that. And so I wanted to ask for an indigenous uh, company that's in the industry, how can they um, refocus their business to be able to secure funding since now there's a lot of shift in funding. And so how can they try to restructure their business to be still relevant in this whole, because technology is expensive. So how can, um, indigenous companies restructure their businesses to be able to take advantage of the opportunities. Okay, I'm not. When you talk about indigenous companies, what type of companies are you talking about? Are you talking so, about um, uh, operators? I, I just give me an like, uh, yes. Yeah, so, for example, an operator or a service company, an indigenous service company. Yes. Please. So, for operators, for instance, what I know, operators really. Um, already have consultants and some people even doing this for them, help helping them to um, re, you know, look at their plan and begin to adjust it. So it's all about staying informed, right? There's really, it's not really a major big deal. In fact, it's actually easier to transform when you're a smaller company. Total, Total underwent a major massive transformation. Um, I think a couple of years ago, it's actually much easier for smaller companies. In fact, some of the smaller companies I've dealt with are quicker to pick up new technologies when we bring the new technologies. They are quicker to go for um, new trainings, new quicker to do. So it's actually relatively easier for the smaller companies to upskill. It's just about wanting to do it and their management deciding that, hey, we want to go this way. So they go into maybe for a company like SLB, you come to us because we have the experience, the global experience, and then we help you do your what we call digital roadmap to help you, you know, take on some of this because it's not everything that SLB sells that will be useful to you. You know, some, uh, yes, I'm a sales person, but I will tell you, hey, this is, I wouldn't, just because I want money doesn't mean I will sell this to you. So sometimes we go in a very structured way and stuff. So it's, it's all about having the will or wanting to do it and then taking advantage. Now for the smaller service companies, I know of, um, you know, cases where people are able to form some kind of partnerships like what Mr. Um, um, Boateng touched on. That is what will really help them because they might not have the um, financial capability to handle some of these things, but it's about also partnering, you know, coming to some collaborative partnerships, right, with 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 some of these um, bigger names, and then you become like a rep for them here. That helps you to upskill your people on one hand, and in the other hand, also make some revenue from selling whatever product or stuff. So that's that's pretty much how I would look at it. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, there are any more questions? Let's see. Okay, so um, I have a question also for Mr. Boating. Um, you measure, um, yes, you measure. You mentioned about the uh, new prospects of the new discoveries you in the in the oil and gas field in Ghana. And so, 
I wanted to ask, are there specific um, policies or regulations that prioritize um, local companies when it comes to um, this, this new discoveries? Hello, Mr. Barton. Mm. Hello, hello. Sorry, my internet dropped. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Okay. All right. So I was saying you mentioned um, the new in investments coming and the new opportunities, the discoveries that are being made in the oil and gas industry. And so I'm asking if there are specific regulations or the policies that prioritize indigenous companies ah, to ah, ah. take advantage of oh, these opportunities. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, basically, the, the existing um local content regulations, as I said, provide opportunities for Ghanaian companies, and actually, it gives preference to Ghanaian companies when it comes to opportunities within the sector. When you look at even one in the EMP area of EMP sector, for instance, um, in terms of location of blocks, uh, previous are given to. Um, capable Ghanaian companies to acquire blocks. But you know that the EMP area is very challenging, capital intensive, um, technologically sophisticated. So I myself will not advise any Ghanaian company, given our companies are quite small, um, and given the risk involved with the EMP activities and, and the probability of making successful discovery, I would advise any Ghanaian company just in the EMP area to partner with well established yeah, um, foreign companies so that they will share the risk. And most of the, the areas that are our thing that I see prospect for Ghanaian companies in, in the service area, as far as those discoveries are concerned, um, provision of various services. And um, this is the area that I will encourage Ghanaian companies to go in both the low hanging fruits and the mid technical services. Luckily, like you have built enough capacity. And in the main technical service in the area of I mean, fabrication, especially in the engineering services, fabric maintenance, um, <clears throat> and other areas, which are things that Ghanaian companies are going. Now, I don't look up on regulations. Most a lot of these mid technical services have been reserved for Ghanaian companies. And this is the area that I was saying that our young engineers, young technicians, young professionals can come into partnership and provide this mid technical um, services to the oil and gas um, companies. Now, luckily, if the pecan development come on stream as expected, and then 10 and enhancement projects also come as expected, so to create a new set of opportunities, both for employment and for also for businesses to come in. And for those who are interested in channel partnerships, um, when it comes to commission, our uh, business advisory and enterprise development will share with you the um some in terms of the, the operators um the um the, the operator of the APSO um uh, the and model and other service companies the companies that they use the OEMs that they use to provide those um equipment and spare parts the commission BAD department will share with you for you to know these um uh, OEMs and you can contact them um, for opportunity of entering into channel partnership agreement with them so they can provide not only procurement services but also the sales services for them. These are the areas that I think that you, our uh, young professionals can also look beyond getting direct employment from these companies. All right, thank you very much. I think my co moderator Matilda has a question. Hello, Matilda. Yeah, hello, Kelvin. Yes, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So my question is to Dr. Papabini. Um, please, during your presentation, you made mention that the expatriates focus more on the technical roles than the really the locals. So my question is, it is so obvious that the Ghanaian graduates will lack their practical skills that's 
that are needed for immediate employment in the petroleum value chain. So I want to ask how the industry players and the local institutions, how can they collaborate more effectively to ensure that the graduates possess the skills that the industry needs? All right, um, thanks for that. So what I would I mean, advise is um, institutions should collaborate more with industry. For example, when I was at Modec, for instance, I mean, we signed an MOU with, I mean, RMU as well as NUS to bring in interns for, I mean, training purposes as well. And I would urge, I mean, smaller companies, like for Stack Energy, for instance, we have, I mean, instituted a traineeship program for the best graduating engineering students where they come over to our end to come and then learn much about the downstream, midstream, and then upstream sector. So I would encourage small companies like us, small business companies like us to go ahead and then approach academia and then offer internships slots. That's the only way that we can build this I mean, nation of ours. And I would encourage I mean, the younger engineers to also apply for internship. Apply for an internship, not with the hope of getting money from it, but apply for internship on voluntary yeah. once we go ahead to, I mean, learn whatever they, I mean, learn the processes and then the engineering, I mean, system that they have for you. So that's what I have to say, true collaboration, industry and, and, and academia. And it's doable. I have seen it before when I was at Modak, as I said, I, there was an oh, there's an existing MOU between Modec and then NUST. And of course, Modec and RMU as well. So once you approach um, the issue from that angle, definitely, I mean, the area of the school competency gap will be bridged. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think there's a question in the chat for uh, Madam Nidra. Someone asked um, some companies that are into pure computing and data analysis that support service in Ghana or Africa. So I think the person is asking how can these companies benefit from the um, opportunities in the oil and gas industry? If I'm to understand, they are called um, data analysis companies. And yes, and computing, yes. Well, in all honesty, um, it's going to require some domain knowledge because guess what? Garbage in, garbage out. So if I give you data, you analyze it, you can analyze it and give me results. But if you do not know the... That's why I, if you, when I was talking about the most important things or the way forward, one of the core things I put there was, you know, strengthen the core. So they need to layers with um, um, bringing, you know, core technical people who understand the data, right? If I give you pressure data or temperature data, borehole temperature data, somebody should be there who understands the implication of this. So that's when you take it and you want to maybe build some kind of model or something to predict, I don't know, let's say pore pressure or something. At the very least, you would know that what result you're getting is make is, it makes sense else it will be a case of just putting something in and then it gives you a result, but it is not useful. So that is not a problem. It's just about upskilling. So both ways you get the data people upskilling into the technical and then technical skilling into the data. So that way they can collaborate very well. So that would be my you know, recommendation. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Boating, I think your screen is still on just so you know. I think there's one more question in the chat box. Um, so someone asked, Emmanuel asks, please, how do we ensure that young engineers and professionals are treated with fairness in terms of remunerations? Since most expert companies, especially the Chinese, in the name of training, do not treat and pay local force, force work as well. I think uh, Dr. Papa, Benin, I think this question. Oops. Yeah, for me, as I said earlier on, it's, it's a bit tricky, right? Companies, each company I mean, will have their policies in place in terms of the salaries and then the incentives I mean, in place. So you have to choose one. 
either it's money or your career. And as I said, the two do not mix, right? Um, if you have the opportunity to, to get employed, even by a Chinese firm, right? If, I mean, I were to be you, right? I would rather focus, um, if I'm able to break even with my transportation and everything, I'd rather focus on getting the experience for the next three years, four years, five years or so, so that I can move on. When I left Sweden to Ghana in the year 2005, right? I was then living in Akosombo with my parents. I had a job at Tamaoya family, right? By then I was paid about 500 Ghana, right? And I was picking troll troll from Akosombo to Tamaoya family every day. I, I leave Akosombo around 3 a.m. Then I get to Tamaoya family by 7 a.m. Then work will close around 4.30. I'll pick a troll troll to the station at committee one and then just pick a troll troll again from committee one to a person. I did that for about six months or so. So I was able to gather enough money to run for a place in, in Tama. And then of course, I mean, I moved there and I had a shorter di distance from work to home. So I think that you have to sacrifice and then just make, I mean, just gain that I mean, experience. So you should just have at the back of your mind that you are going to learn on the work for about, I mean, two years or three years, because so you can build up your CV and then just go ahead and then get a much better offer somewhere. I'm not in favor of going ahead to challenge the organization that you work for about salaries and then incentives and all those things. In my career, I have never asked for salary increment before. I have never asked for overtime before. But then guess what? When I, when I was at Modek, I was closer to the then I mean, GM, right? I was quite close. He would invite me for parties and everything. Then two years down the line, he called me and they said, that, how come you are close to me, but you have never asked me for salary increment? Then I was like, no, I passed a comment that the organization knows my wife and then they are paying me according to my wife. So I see no reason to go and ask for salary increment or fairness. Then he was quiet. Then, then he tripled my salary for me, right? And then he, of course, promoted me to be a manager and then all those things. So it's about your career. It's about what you want. If you know that you want to be a senior manager or a GM in the next I mean, 15 years or so, you should be able to sacrifice. When I was, when I began my career at all, I was just breaking even. I wasn't making any extra money. Oh, all my money went into transportation and then food to the time that I was able to get enough experience to move on to Modek and then all those places. Yeah, thanks for that. Thank you so much. And I know Madam Nidra has a comment on this also. So I'm going to comment. I think the question I just needed to, you know, take it a different route. So um, when it comes to salaries, treatment and stuff, and that's a big place where regulation actually helps. Angola, Equatorial Guinea and some of those countries have very, very strong regulations on how you treat their people, be it in, whether they are interns or whether they are um, 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 experienced hires. There are specific rules, right? Even in the UAE, we have that. And um, I am not... I'm not. The, I I believe in loyalty, but I also believe in speaking up because I spent time, I spent energy, I went to school, and the generation that we are coming to see. I mean, the Gen Z are not going to sit down and say, "Oh, okay, I'm going to sit and endure for so long," because they are having skill sets that are easily transferable ac across different um, 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 industries. So I would say one of the biggest things to do is regulation. Regulation will help us a lot if we if we have if you look into the Equatorial Guinea laws, and then I think um, Angola those to i mean it's it's it, it, it's 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 very robust and it's at the end of the day it favors your people of course we don't want a situation whereby you're going to turn your people make them lazy because the regulations go so there's a balance they strike a balance in there but it's in there if not people are going to take advantage of the people all in the name of training i do not support that and so i would never say that okay we should just let it yes there's some form of sacrifice that is needed but not to the point where you can actually see clearly being you are being taken advantage of and unfortunately because your laws are silent you can't do anything about it that for me is just modern day in quote uh, slavery for want of a better way to put it so i would say one of the ways that we can get core help here is for um the ministries or the whoever is in charge to help us ngos get in charge help and then help to structure the local content in such a way that um it's fair to the people 
to the company to the companies but also fair to the people so that's that's what i just wanted to um add on this thank you very much thank you um i think we have one last question and i think this is for mr Boati. It says that um, i'd like to find out if the separate local content requirements and regulations for oil refineries in Ghana or the downstream sector in general? Because it seems like the local content laws are limited only to the upstream activities. Mr. Boati. Um, I can take that. Hello? I can take okay. That. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think you are right. The local content regulations is limited to the upstream um, sector of the industry. Um, um, refinery uh, and distribution of products are downstream activities. So the mandate of the local content regulation doesn't extend there. Um, however, if you look at the refinery area, I think that in terms of the local participation, most of the downstream sector. Um, it's done, done very well. I, I would say I don't have the data. I can say that it's about 90, 90 95% um, Ghanaian control. The exception of the ownership of the BDCs or maybe refinery. When it comes to provision of services and, the, and employment, it's mainly Ghanaian. So local content law that is extend to the downstream uh, sector. But I just want to have a, um, a quick comment on the previous discussion that India and I think Papa uh, made contribution in terms of the treatment of workers and salary and others. Um, I would say that um, the local content regulations have enough provisions to ensure that, and even our labor law have enough provisions to ensure that Ghanaians and every employee is treated fairly. Uh, very often there have been a concern about the salary discrepancy between locals and expatriates. And I think those concerns are quite legitimate. And the commission is not oblivious of those um, concerns about the um, perceived, I won't even say perceived, but rare big salary discrepancies between locals and, uh, and expatriates. Um, in view of that, we have come out with the localization policy. And the policy is very clear that we, we have addressed um, that um, big salary discrepancies. And the position of the commission is that for every rule that requires certain qualifications, anybody that occupies that qualification, no matter the nationality, should be paid the same salary. However, people who are expatriates and they're coming from foreign country, you have to agree on an expatriate premium for them. So the basic salary has to be the same and the expatriate premium has to be agreed depending on where the expatriate is coming from, the particular circumstances, tax differential between the low home country and the foreign country, and we agree on the expatriate premium so that for the expatriate to compensate him for coming to um, Ghana. And that's our position. And we think that once this policy is implemented, we're able to address that uh, big side discrepancy. But my, young, my advice to our young people is also that our attitude, attitude has to be changed. When you go to work environment, don't expect overnight to be paid such a high salary in day one. Or don't expect to, to acquire a vehicle, buy a house in the first two or three years of employment, or to be promoted to a very senior management position, a management role within a few years of employment. What you need to do is to learn the job, acquire the technical skills. Once you acquire those skills, salary and other benefits of employment will come naturally. Um, I regret to say that our generation, the young people in Ghana, there, there have been a gradual deterioration of our work attitude. It's very bad. I've been here in Guyana, and I was told by some um, can be Ghanaian companies, they send a number of people by here. Come and work. About, they told me about eight people have been sent back home to Ghana, not because of their competence. They are good um, technically in the way they do, but the problem is their attitude. We came here 
demonstrate very terrible attitude over here. They saying that they have to be sent back. So my advice to our young people is that please change your attitude. Have a positive attitude to us. As for technical skills, I always say that they can be acquired. You can train people for them to acquire technical skills. But attitude follow you wherever you go. It happened even on oil and gas area. Now, if you look at areas such as construction and even in the hotel business, now construction, people are, Ghanaians are bringing uh, artisans from Togo to come and take various construction work. You go to hotel, they are bringing people from India and other places. And these are generally low, I was low hanging skills that exist in Ghana. And because of our terrible attitude, they bring people from outside to come and um, do those work for us. So please, as we try to get, create opportunity for you through local content, um, and local content revolutions, we also, and uh, this goes to people at my universities, particular institutions, that we need um, a program that will really um, teach our young people of positive attitudes to work with. It's very important. And this is my advice to our um, young um, men and, and women who are trying to acquire and play a role in our upcoming industry. That discipline is very important. Thank you so much. And I think uh, Dr. Papa was going to say something about the same thing. Exactly my point. Exactly my point. Right. I think that I mean it is increasingly become obvious that the Ghanaian professional or the Ghanaian engineer or the or the Ghanaian workforce or the Ghanaian staff is highly indisciplined. So most companies these days prefer to go for Filipinos and then Indians to come and then work instead of um, Ghanaians. So we have to change. We have to change our ways of doing things. Thank you. Thank you so much. And unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions, but I'm sure you can reach out to our speakers maybe later to discuss your questions. Um, thank you so much for all the valuable insights. Thank everyone who asked questions for keeping the discussion. And it was a very insightful one. So now we would um, have the membership committee chairperson to give us a talk on a membership drive. Mr. Yao, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for making time to join this important um, engagement. Really, FP is about creating opportunities, um, for networking opportunities, as well as um, prof professional development opportunities. And those are the four main, some of the main benefits of um, FP to members, really. You have access to technical resources, technical resource persons, um, you have the opportunity to network, um, meet and share ideas with peers and opportunities to volunteer. And another important aspect of moving into the job market is having on your CV that you have volunteered. So SP gives you the perfect platform to do that. And in terms of professional development, there is access to training and certification. Um, SP has their own certification, but you do have opportunities to sign up onto other professional development courses. And then there's the chance to be recognized um, in the industry. I think those four benefits really help you see what SP is about and what you can get out of it. Another aspect of SP is that we do do membership engagement with um, on the technical side, which we saw earlier in this year, distinguished lecture with Dr. Rita Okoro Afo. And then we participated at the local content conference last year. We also have had corporate engagements with the likes of SLB Ghana, Ghana Gas, Hemsolve. Um, there have been a lot of engagements with several um, corporate institutions that have been the backbone of the of of our society and how we get our events um put together in terms of men, um engagement is is beyond technical we do a bit of well-being and csr and with the well-being aspect 
we did organize our annual soccer gala last year and hopefully by by march we will be starting our round for the soccer gala for for 2024 so hopefully this time around there'll be a bit more involvement we have also participated with our donation to city fm with their lower volta project um that has brought some relief to certain people we did do our health walk which is important aspect for us to to meet in a social gathering but we know sp is not just about petroleum engineers there are several technical special specialties that we focus on drilling completions projects production reservoir engineers hfc um, technic technical specialty production and operations management and data science and engineering and, and uh, analytics. Whilst these encompass a lot of um, different aspects of the oil and gas industry, if you you are in the in a economics background, whilst you're in the industry, you can you can participate. HSD, you can participate. It's not just restricted to engineers. So I'd i like to entreat you all to let your colleagues be aware if you want SP to come do a roadshow. Yeah, we're more than welcome and happy to come and do that just so people can appreciate that it's not just a petroleum engineer society it's for everybody that's why we like to call it it's the place for oil and gas professionals so anybody that finds themselves in the oil and gas profession they will be relevant and will be important to grow in sp so we're hoping that after this you reach out to us on our various platforms um on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, we are more than welcome to answer any of your questions. And you can also reach us via our email addresses and and numbers that are provided in the slides, and also on our website www.spghana.com. Over there, if you are a member, you can renew your membership. If you are yet to join SP, there will be there's a link there where you can join us. And once you join, you realize that you have access to over 400 um, plus professional members in Ghana, as well as over 800 student members that you could mentor and help get into the industry for the benefits of the industry as well as the society. But really, SP is a society for every oil and gas professional. So make it a point to join and participate and volunteer. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, membership chair. Thank you. Please, Dr. Papa Beni, can you please give your final words? Yeah, I would I would like to conclude that I mean um you guys shouldn't see I mean the challenges as barriers, rather go out, apply for voluntary internship, and then maybe try as much as possible to I mean beef up your LinkedIn account, show up other programs, interact with the seniors in the industry. And I, I, I strongly believe that the sky is going to be your limit. And then focus on, I mean, having positive, I mean, attitude towards work. And this issue of, I mean, fighting organizations, fighting over salaries, fighting over, I mean, I mean, Fighting the company for salary increment in service and the rest is not really helping us as a country. It is gradually becoming a canker, and I urge each and every one of us to move away from that um, approach. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Doc. Mr. Boatin, please, your final words. Uh, I don't know if he's still on the call. Okay. I don't think Mr. Boatin is on the call, so I'll proceed to the closing remarks since we, we are far behind time. Okay. 
So on behalf of SP Ghana Young Professionals, I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to all our wonderful speakers for taking time out of your busy schedule to share your invaluable insight with us. We are much grateful. I would also like to thank the SP Ghana Young Professionals Committee for organizing this much needed webinar. I think we would need more of this. Lastly, I would also want to thank each and every one of you for participating in this webinar. And I encourage everyone to share their learnings with their colleagues and to also stay active on all SP Ghana social media pages for more insightful workshops. I would also want to acknowledge Madam Nidra for your time. I think she's out, but we'll still acknowledge her. So please, I would, I would encourage everyone to stay active on all SP Ghana social media pages for more insightful workshops. Thank you and have a good afternoon.